What do you think when you see it? Stay alive. And I knew that I had to survive this. I went up like that with my hands up to show no threat. This was a lynching on video. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendants. I think the verdicts lit a match, but the tinder was already in place and very dry. Are you able to forgive those cops? Have you let those demons go? Did you hang on to that money or did you throw it away? Can we can we all get along? Can we can we get along? March 3rd, 1991, 25-year-old Rodney King is thrust from obscurity to a national symbol of police brutality. The brutal beating that took place here along Foothill Boulevard in Los Angeles, California, would reverberate across the country. A city in flames. Entire neighborhoods burned to the ground. Now, two decades later, what's it like to be the man whose beating, seen round the world, ignited one of the worst race riots in U.S. history? Rodney King, now 45, usually begins his day on a skateboard. The exercise, he says, keeps his muscles from stiffening. One side effect from all his injuries. But skateboarding also brings him peace from a haunting past and the demons he's battled for the last 20 years. Do you still have nightmares? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, um, I do. What's a nightmare? Do you wake up, like, tossing and turning? Sometimes even hearing the voices, you know, that was going on that night. You know, hands behind your back. Um, lay down. Get down. Get down. Get down, you effing nigger. You know, those those words, you know. And so I'll, so I'll have to wake up and, oh, hey, man, it's all right. Look outside. And it's all green, blue. That time has passed on, but the, 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 night, the nightmares and the memories is still there, you know. So take me back to that night 20 years ago. And you're driving along, you know, you're in your Hyundai. We were coming from a friend of mine's house. King's nightmare begins just after midnight. He and two friends, out celebrating, head west on the 210 freeway. I had just gotten word that my old construction company had uh, called me to come back to work that following Monday. But the celebration is cut short. State police clock King's car going 110 miles per hour and immediately start a nearly eight mile high speed chase through LA neighborhoods. King has always maintained he may have been speeding, but only a little. However, in this rare interview, he sets the record straight. I, I was doing 100. I did every bit of 100. And I'm not proud of it. Why didn't you stop? because I had a job to go to that Monday. And I knew I was on parole and I knew I wasn't supposed to be drinking. And I'm like, oh my God. Following our interview, Rodney King agrees to relive those terrifying moments by taking me back to the scene. Coming down to 210. As we retrace his steps, we discuss those split second decisions. My mind was rattling, either I can get off and go over here to my ex-wife's house, because her her, uh, her daddy is a San Bernardino retired police. At this time, I'm, uh, I'm thinking, where can I go? I exit here on Paxton. So when you exited here, were they behind you? Could you see? No, they were, they were, they were nowhere in sight. When I came to this light right here, that's when I noticed the helicopter. He's way in front of me, the lights beaming down, going across the street. My heart is like, my body's hot, and I'm scared, nervous, because I knew it was going to be a, pretty much a beating from running from him at that point. Where'd you pull over? I seen all those apartments over there, so 
I said, oh, man, let me stop right here. If it goes down, somebody will see it. Once he stops, they are surrounded by police. King's two friends are arrested without incident. Well, put your hands But up. Rodney King would have a much different fate. When I, when I opened the door, she said, take three steps back away from the car, which I did then. Took three steps back. When I took the three steps back, I said, lay down. So when I laid down, I laid down like this. And uh, my face was facing this way so I could see him. And they said, no, put your, put your effing head down, face down. When, when I finally faced down, he, bam, took the blow, bam, a real hard blow to the temple. What were they saying to you? We're going to kill you, nigga. We're going to kill you, nigga. Run. I was knew I was doomed for death. So when he said that, I just looked for a clearance, just kind of like blocking and looking for a clearance. When he did that, I just looked, and then I, I went up like that to run this way with my hands up to show no threat. And uh, that's when I didn't know, but my leg was broke. Look closely at the beginning of this unedited version of the video. You can see King does try to get up and run. He appears to lift his arms before falling to the ground. It's this portion of the video that later impacts a jury's decision. Blood is just gushing down the street. It felt death. You know, the death wasn't far away. What's it like coming here, getting down on the street, reliving this again? I can't believe I'm alive to get down there. I can't believe I'm alive today. King says the chase and the beating last a combined 15 minutes. 15 minutes of hell. He sustains more than 50 baton blows and shocks by a taser gun. But it's not over. Somehow, he has to find the strength to survive. As the ambulance rushes him to a nearby hospital, he begins to find it more and more difficult to breathe. I was blowing the blood out of my sinuses and out of my mouth so I could breathe. King's injuries, which include 11 fractures, are too severe to be treated at Pacifica Hospital. So he has to be rushed to the trauma unit at USC Medical Center. His initial surgery takes three doctors working five hours straight to keep him alive. It was incredible how many fractures there were. In a CNN interview in 1994, the ophthalmologist who treated King said some bones were so pulverized they were like grains of sand. We're, we're surprised that he actually was alive. When you finally woke up, do you remember the first time you saw your reflection? Yes. I just started crying when I looked at myself. I was like, yeah, my, will I ever look normal again? In severe pain and depressed by the possibility of more jail time, King knows he has to tell his side of the story. But who would believe him? There is no evidence. Or so he thinks. This is history. This is history. We finally caught the Loch Ness Monster with a camcord. Coming up, a city explodes in rage. And later, Rodney King, a life haunted by demons. Do you still have issues when it comes to addiction? hospital Rodney King thinks he's just another unknown victim of police brutality little does he know his arrest and brutal beating are captured on video by George Holiday who lived in the apartments across the street I was just amazed at what was happening uh, uh, feeling uh, you know, what the hell could he be doing could they have done to, to deserve uh, such punishment two days after the beating the video is broadcast around the world Instantly, Rodney King's name becomes a battle cry against injustice. The officer's actions are exposed. King has his evidence, but he has no idea until a nurse tells him. She said, just stay still. Just stay still, baby. You're in bad shape. We've seen it all on tape. She said, just get yourself well and get out of here. 
when she said, I saw it on tape, were you like, oh my gosh, there's evidence. So now they're going to see. Did you, did that go through your head? Yeah. I said to myself, um, at least it's on tape. Maybe I got a chance. Maybe I got a chance. The video ignites a firestorm of outrage. Rodney King is released without being charged. Milton Grimes was one of King's attorneys. I saw it on TV and I'm saying, they have got to stop beating our brothers like that in South Africa. Because I just imagine it was out of the country. As Los Angeles Mayor Tom Bradley launches an investigation, so does the FBI. Even the president demands answers. It was sickening to see the beating that was rendered. There's no way, in my view, to, uh, to explain that away. It was outrageous. You get to see it. L.A. City Councilman Bernard Parks was a deputy police chief in 1991. He says the tape confirmed what many in the black community already felt. What the symbolism of that video created is it validated in the minds of thousands of people that this is the way police work has been done and was done for decades. We finally caught the Loch Ness Monster with a camcord. The district attorney for L.A. County moves quickly. Indictments are announced. LAPD officer Lawrence Powell, Timothy Wynn, Theodore Brasino, and Sergeant Stacy Kuhn have been indicted for assault with a deadly weapon. But racial tensions continue to mount. There is so much publicity and anger. The officer's trial is moved out of L.A. to the predominantly white community of Simi Valley. Author and journalist Lou Cannon covered the Rodney King controversy for the Washington Post. I was very concerned about what was going to happen, but both because of the demographics of, of, of Simi Valley and, and the, the, the demographics of the jury. February 3rd, 1992. Exactly 11 months after Rodney King's controversial arrest, the trial of the four white officers charged in the beating gets underway. Uh, immediately after this incident, uh, you made a call for a rescue ambulance, didn't you? Yes, I did. Armed with the videotape as a star witness, Rodney King feels a conviction is all but certain and justice will be served. I, I just knew it was going to be served. I didn't think I needed a, a, a Johnny Cochran or somebody to fight that case to win the case because I had there were cameras. But will a jury of 10 whites, one Hispanic, one Filipino American and no blacks agree. Nearly three months into the trial, a hushed courtroom anxiously awaits the verdict. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Stacy C. Kuhn, not guilty. Three of the accused officers are acquitted of all charges, but the jury is hopelessly deadlocked on one charge of excessive force against Lawrence Powell. A mistrial is declared on that charge. It's hard to be surprised when you felt that way the whole way. You're just hoping for the right decision. And uh, because, you know, I know I'm innocent, and that was the verdict. Powell's attorney, Michael Stone, says in the end, the unedited video worked against King and helped prove the officer's case. Most of the, of the nation only saw a few snippets where it's the most violent. They didn't see Rodney King on the ground. They didn't see him get up and run at Powell. Why do you think the jurors came to a not guilty verdict? In a use of force case, if the officers do what they're trained to do, how can you find him guilty of a crime? And the jury understood that, that Rodney King was always the aggressor. Rodney King had the ability at any time to say, that's it, I don't want it anymore, and he never did. But with your initial reaction when you heard not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty? The public was not going to accept it. And King was right. This is a reaction just outside the courthouse. Sheriff's deputies having to protect Sergeant Stacy Kuhn as he makes his way to his car. Movie director John Singleton is in the crowd and makes a chilling prediction. By having this verdict, what these people have done, they let, let the fuse to a bomb. Within just two hours after the verdicts, downtown Los Angeles is a war zone.
I said, you know, if I was 20 years younger and had some new tennis shoes, I would be in the streets tonight. This was a lynching on video. Looters go on a rampage. Innocent people are randomly attacked. White truck driver Reginald Denny just happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. He hasn't heard about the riots when he exits the interstate. Within minutes, Denny is attacked. My right window broke, and that time uh, I was extremely frightened. It's a, it's a strange feeling to be uh, scared, I guess. That's all Denny can remember about the beating. But Bobby Green will never forget it. Green, a fellow trucker, sees the attack on television and rushes to the scene nearly three miles away. When he arrives, he finds Denny back in his truck trying to drive himself. Ray is already inside the truck, already trying to drive his truck himself. So I pushed him over to the other seat, and I told him I'm here to save his life. Green drives Denny's truck to the hospital, arriving just in time. Uh, it gave me glory to my heart that I saved another human being. Bobby Green is just one of many heroes that day. Despite all the calls for calm, the rioting continues. The president deploys federal troops. And let me assure you, I will use whatever force is necessary to restore order. But as the city burns around them, some business owners will take matters into their own hands. As flames spread across wide sections of the city, Rodney King remained secluded, but stunned by the magnitude of destruction. Do you anticipate the, the level of violence that would happen? Not on that scale, but we were, we were told that like a couple of days before, you know, be careful, stay home. Entire neighborhoods are reduced to rubble. By the end of the first day of rioting, 12 people have already been killed. While much of the looting is random and the perpetrators are as diverse as the city itself, Radio Korea broadcaster Richard Choi notices a disturbing pattern. We received a lot of phone calls from the, uh, the Korean merchant in uh, South LA. What's going on here? What's going on here? Choi says callers are telling him Korean-American-owned businesses are being specifically targeted. And while their pleas for help seem to be ignored, their property is ransacked by roving bands of looters. I wish this whole thing was a joke, something that I, something I dreamed that I could wake up from. When I watch the uh, TV monitor, is this America? We came this country to want to have uh, some kind of uh, established some American dream. So this is American dream here? Were those grocers valid in that you ignored their pleas for help, meaning the police? Department? Well, I think they're valid in the sense that they weren't ignored. There was no resources to go to those locations. And I think that many thousands of people felt they were ignored. They just were, there weren't enough officers. Long before the riots, tensions had been simmering between some black residents and the Korean American merchants. There was a language barrier. There wasn't an understanding. There was rough treatment. There was poor communication skill. If those people are citizens and law-abiding citizens, can't they open stores in whatever communities they want? They were providing a service, but that personal relationship was missing. Those simmering racial tensions ignite after the Rodney King verdict. As billowing smoke moves closer to the financial center of Koreatown, attorney David Kemp urges merchants to take action. You believe the LAPD abandoned the Korean American shop owners during that time? When I saw that the LAPD did not get their act together on the second day, 
and that they were telling Korean American merchants in Koreatown to evacuate. That's when I decided to go and ask the Korean American merchants to, to defend themselves. KABC television captures these men apparently taking matters into their own hands. By defending themselves, Kim says, Koreatown became a buffer zone in the battle to prevent the loss of more lives and property. The fact that Koreatown itself uh, uh, was largely unscathed, I think, uh, uh, I, I think you have to credit the people who live there, and particularly the merchants who were, who were armed and defended, defended their property. As the riots enter a fourth day, the man at the center of the storm emerges from obscurity. His voice visibly shaken. King speaks to the world. People, I, um, I just, I just want to say, you know, can we, can we all get along? Can we, can we get along? Did you feel compelled to come out and say what you said after the first trial? Can we all just get along? Because I'm exhausted and I'm tired of seeing the same hateful um, thing go on in our country. And also Mayor Tom Bradley, Los Angeles Mayor Tom Bradley, uh, extending the curfew area in the city of Los Angeles. It takes six days to restore order. The damage is staggering. 55 people lost their lives. Another 2,000 are injured. Property damages exceed $1 billion. One week later, President Bush makes a personal visit to Koreatown to ease tensions. It helped uh, the Korean Americans because they felt like the system had abandoned them. I think that it, it at least helped them heal their um, wounds. The events that unfold after the jury's verdict present a watershed moment in the history of race relations across the country. But in L.A., those relations are soon tested again. As another trial keeps the city on edge. In our businessmen, we are ready too. The LAPD says if violence breaks out here in LA, it will be ready. If you take to the streets, you will give the police the legal right to kill you. Nearly a year after riots and rage rock Los Angeles, LA braces itself for the outcome of a second trial. Under pressure from President Bush, the Department of Justice files federal charges against the four police officers acquitted in Simi Valley. The question at the heart of this case, were Rodney King's civil rights violated? There was a palpable tension, even downtown at the Roy Ball building where this trial was held. We have tried to get along with minorities. There are noticeable differences between the two trials. This one would take place in downtown Los Angeles, and Rodney King would take the witness stand. Prosecutors intentionally kept King out of the courtroom for the first trial. They thought I was going to go all crazy and act a fool on stage, and it wasn't about that. I just want to get up here and testify and just tell the truth. Another difference. This time, there are two African-American jurors. Journalist Lou Cannon says the fear of riots loomed. These jurors, they were from Southern California. They were scared. Defense attorney Michael Stone admits the climate hurt his case. There was no way in the world that any jury would acquit all of the defendants again. Are you saying that you walked into a courtroom with a client who you believed had no chance? Pretty much so, yeah. I was so um, 
positive and new in my heart that I'm not even worried about it. If they don't call me, we're still going to win. Rodney King takes a witness stand and testifies that racial epithets were used during the beating. His testimony would spark a war of words between the legal teams. Mike Stone knows that the word nigger was used. Did your client ever use the word nigger? Absolutely not. No one out there did. And as he's lying prone, he says, someone said, in, we're going to kill you. And that's when you see him getting up. He is still willing to stand up in this courtroom before a jury and say, they said the word nigger, and then say, well, maybe it was killer. I'm not sure. Lawrence Powell, accused of making the racial slur, also disputed King's testimony. Rodney King is no doubt a liar. The evidence bears that out. First you said it wasn't racial, then you said it was, and then you said you heard the N-word, and then you said you didn't. Oh, no, I heard it, but my mom said, whatever you do, don't say it was racism. So I, I respect her for that at that time. I know what I heard. After 45 days, the federal trial ends. I think we will be acquitted. And but that 1% of, you know, that we might not be is real worrisome. On the sixth day of deliberations, the jury reaches a verdict. We the jury find the defendant, Stacy C. Kern. I had my arm on Larry Powell's shoulder, and I leaned over to him, and I said, we're going down, bud. And what was his reaction? He tensed. He tensed. We, the jury, in the above entitled car, find the defendant. Two out of the four officers are found guilty. It was like, God dang, I, was, I just hope we just get one. I hope we just get one on that. If we get one, we're good. So to get the two, I was really happy. Sergeant Stacy Coon and Officer Lawrence Powell were both sentenced to two and a half years in federal prison. The verdict seemed to satisfy the community. No riots erupted. It was here at the Royval Federal Building where guilty verdicts gave Rodney King the justice he was looking for. But one more trial was still to come. Rodney King's lawsuit would determine how much money, if any, he received for his injuries. King's civil suit against the city of Los Angeles was his third trial in three years. I fit this profile of the conservative African-American Cynthia Kelly, the only African-American juror during the civil suit, says the jury deliberations were contentious. Half of them had no sympathy whatsoever. They did not care at all. They just didn't care. Like, he broke the law. He deserved what he got. And what do you think of that? I told them they were crazy. No one deserves to get beat like that. The jury eventually sided with Kelly and awarded Rodney King three point eight million dollars so many people um been through what i've went through and i just happen to be first in line to uh for it to get recognized and people say hey we're not taking this shit no more we're through up next rodney king's battle to put the beating behind him are you able to forgive those cops Rodney King beating ignited L.A.'s simmering racial tension. And one message came through loud and clear. Reforms had to be made. We are not going out in the 90s like we did in the 60s. We want justice, and we want it now. We want it now. The main impact of the Rodney King case is that it accelerated change the LAPD style of policing, which was lean, mean, no time for the community policing, that had to change. It was only five blacks in my class of 85. Former LAPD Chief Bernard Park says he recognized the department's top officers needed to be as diverse as the city. When I was a chief, 
uh, promoted the first Korean commander, the first uh, Chinese captain, the first uh, Chinese captain that's now a deputy chief, the first female deputy chief. Court-mandated reforms also gave the black community a voice in how their neighborhoods are patrolled. Hi, guys. How you doing? And as a result, according to the Justice Department, complaints of excessive force are down sharply. The community has complained for decades that they couldn't get their complaints considered. Uh, they couldn't get one taken. And I changed the system almost the first six months I was in office. Case in point, Park says investigating complaints and following tips within the black community was crucial in capturing one of the most prolific serial killers in U.S. history. He was dubbed the Grim Sleeper because he appeared to take a 14-year break between killing sprees. Los Angeles Police Department, Robbery Homicide Division is here to confirm that we made an arrest. Finally, in 2010, Lonnie Franklin Jr. was arrested and charged with the murders of at least 10 black women from neighborhoods hardest hit by the riot. For the families, this case is solved because of you. Yes, it was science. Yes, it was good detective work, but it was because of the families. In the years since the Rodney King beating and riots, there's been a seismic shift in race relations between the LAPD and the black community. And here in Koreatown, most businesses have emerged from the ashes and are thriving again. Attorney David Kim is trying to find a common thread in history to unify the community. African Americans are the ones who had paved the road for the Korean merchants to come and do business in this country. But even today, the relationship is sometimes tenuous. The relationship between African American and Korean American community I, hasn't improved as much as we would like. But I think there is a tolerance that has been uh, built up because of that experience. As for the officers convicted in the Rodney King beating, both Powell and Kuhn still live in Southern California. They declined our request to be interviewed. They have picked up their lives and put them back together. Do you think the officers, if they could do it all over again, would they do anything differently? They'd walk away. Let them go. Let him go, even though he's breaking the law. Mm -hmm. Why? Because of, look at what happened to them. Look at what happened to them. Why would they want that to happen again, to, to them or to anyone? I think Mr. King has told the truth. The King case also had a profound impact on the lawyers who argued the case on opposite sides. If I was to have been able to write a script for a case, this would have been a script that afforded me an opportunity to be involved in helping our society progress to the point of peace and civil relation. It's all how the jury looks at it now. History has recorded that Rodney King incident as a racist beating of a black man by four white police officers, and that's really tragic. I failed in my singular mission, I guess, to um, change minds about that case. As for the LAPD, Bernard Park says the culture within the department has changed, but it remains a work in progress. I think it's an evolving process that everybody works at every day, and when there's a misstep, you try to correct it. Uh, you don't try to slough it off. You don't try to ignore it. You have to move forward and see how you can make it better. For Rodney King, the vicious beating never seems to fade from memory. Do you think the relationship now is better between the black community and the LAPD? I will say it has improved. It is, it is, it has gotten better, yeah. But it just don't stop there. You have to keep working on it. Coming up, Rodney King, 20 years later. Do you still have issues when it comes to addiction? Did you hang on to that money or did you throw it away? Are you able to forgive those cops? And a surprising twist in his personal life. In the 20 years since Los Angeles was turned upside down, the city still faces its share of challenges. We have 140 languages spoken in the city of LA. It's impossible for any one human being to understand every culture. Every day is a challenge because of the dynamics.
But the riots still haunt some who are at the center of the unrest. I always have flashbacks when I come here and feel sorry and feel regret. Bobby Green, who risked his life to save Reginald Denny, left Los Angeles shortly after the riots. And the reason we come back to LA, give me a bad vibe. You know what I'm saying? I, think, I always think about what happened back in, in, in the 90s, the riots. Uh, it was a bad vibe for me. Green now lives an hour away in Rialto, California. Ironically, one of his suburban neighbors is Rodney King. King's working-class neighborhood has a postcard view of the San Gabriel Mountains. He has a modest home with a backyard pool. Today, King is a father of three and has two grandchildren. He's 20 years older and, according to him, a lot wiser. King admits his past is riddled with bad decisions. If you could do it all over again, what would you do? Would you go out that night? Would you... I would have stayed home. I think I would have stayed home. For years after the beating, Rodney King continued to have run-ins with the law. In 1996, he was sentenced to 90 days for a hit-and-run involving his wife. He was also arrested several times on charges related to domestic abuse, drug intoxication, and indecent exposure. Why after all that? That's what people would say, especially black people. Why after all that, Rodney? Are you still getting in trouble? I guess the trouble that they see me in is a part of my life that I'm working on. King's admitted alcoholism and personal problems also caused him to virtually squander his share of the settlement, worth, according to him, one and a half million dollars. He purchased homes for himself and his mother. But what did he do with the rest of the money? Did you hang on to that money or did you throw it away? When I get that shot again, we all know how money can come and it can go. I mean, save, save, save for tomorrow. You're telling me you... It's gone. <laughs> it's pretty much, pretty much. And 20 years later, Rodney King still lives in fear. Years after the beating, you wore a vest? Do oh, you, yeah. Do you yeah, still wear a vest? Oh, uh, yeah, I do, I do. He wears a bulletproof vest in large crowds because threats against his life were all too real. The FBI once infiltrated a white supremacist plot to assassinate King. You got something over your shoulder? You don't, you know, I, I, um, I never feel safe, you know. It's just things that happen. When you are part of history and it changes for the better, you got a lot of devilish people out there that don't like it. And King continues to battle his demons. In 2008, after several stints in rehab, he turned to psychiatrist Dr. Drew Pinsky, appearing on VH1 Celebrity Rehab. We're gonna have a lot of feelings, a lot of anger, and a lot of God knows what. It is. It's 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 with me, but I just you know I don't bring it up unless it's well. Tell me about it. King now admits alcoholism is a lifelong battle that is far from over. Oh, I always have an issue when it comes to alcohol. Well, my dad was alcoholic. The addiction part is in my blood. Um, what I've learned to do is arrest my um, addiction arrested myself so I don't get arrested he says he's finally able to keep many of his demons at bay he's even fallen in love she's a nice friendly person remember Cynthia Kelly one of the jurors from King's civil suit in a strange twist the two are now engaged do you feel like you owe her in some way no uh -uh. not at all I do I don't. <laughs> That's what I don't. King and Kelly formed a friendship immediately after the trial. They would decide to marry 16 years later. What are you guys looking forward to together? Well, I know one thing. She cooks good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the fish. Oh, he put it in the batter. How do you describe the strange twist of affairs? It's just the chemistry. We get along, we have fun, we laugh, we have the same, you know, things we like to do, and it just happened. But Kelly realizes there are still serious challenges ahead. When he sleep, oh my, he has so many nightmares and fighting in his sleep. You're his rock? As long as he don't break it. How could you love someone like Rodney King? 
He's a lovable type of guy. He's like a little teddy bear. <laughs> Two decades after the beating that made him a household name, Rodney King says the mistakes of his past have taught him some tough lessons, a history he does not want to repeat. When Rodney King had the blood on his face, mm -hmm. that mugshot of you with the blood on your face, who was he then? Oh, man. A guy that was almost dead and just, like, happy to be able to still have that face, to be able to see that face. And Rodney King now, all cleaned up, trimmed goatee, beads around his neck. Who is Rodney King now? Um, I'm a... I consider myself a decent, you know, good human being. Are you able to forgive those cops? Oh, yeah. I've been given a break many times in life. Everybody's entitled to a break, you know? I didn't die, you know what I mean? No animosity? Nah. But what?